are listening to the Forza Podcast with your host, Marsh. What up, what up, what up, Canes fans? It is the Forza Podcast. It is Wednesday, August 19th, and we are 22 days away from kickoff. As always, I am joined by my wonderful producer and co-host, Jordan Nelson. Jordan, what's going on, brother? It's Wednesday, my dudes. Yeah. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm very excited. It's, it's a busy day for me, but, you know, it's it's good stuff. Um, you know, NBA playoffs, the first round of the playoffs is one of my favorite times of, of the year. Yeah, how, uh, how's your Utah, how are your Utah Jazz doing? Uh, I mean, I mean, I've, I've, let me see the score is right now. I, uh, I've been at work, so I've just been following it on ESPN. Um, 27 to 20 for Utah. Okay. How about that? All right. Yeah. Let's yeah. see if they can, I, I know Mike Conley is back in the bubble. I don't know if he's playing today. Um, it doesn't look like he is. Yeah. He's not playing. Um, but anyways, I, I thought it would be like, so before Conley went out, I predicted Jazz in seven. And then after I said Nuggets in six or seven. So I think it'll be a close series. Um, you know, I think the Jazz will keep it competitive. But the Nuggets are very, very deep. They have yeah. a lot of talent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't I don't really watch the NBA outside of the Heat. Like, I can't stand LeBron. So I really don't watch. But the Heat won yesterday. We looked pretty yeah. good. And so, yeah, man. Yeah. So we, yeah, Jimmy Butler is, is playing good. And yep. like I said, man, 22 days away. Yeah. Dude, it's, it doesn't, feel, it doesn't feel that here. close, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's almost here. Yeah. This is, I mean, honestly, this is kind of cool because it's like my two favorite times of the year for sports, which is the start of college football and the first round of the NBA playoffs. They're happening a month apart from each other. You know, so like the fir- the first round will carry us into next week, and then at that point we only have two weeks left until football. <sighs> so, I mean, it really, all things considered, and how horrible COVID has been for sports, this is one of the best falls for sports that we'll have in a long time, as long as football actually happens. I think it. I think it is, man. I think it is. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. For right now, we have a very special guest for you guys. One of our favorite guests reoccurring guest ryan roberts so let's get him on the phone cool hey what's ryan, up what's up my friend how you doing good man how's everything We're pretty good. good over here so yeah. we uh we welcome on our good friend and reoccurring guest nfl draft expert ryan roberts what's going on brother not much fellas how you guys doing how's uh how's florida treating you guys down there Dude, well, I'm I'm still in Utah, but uh, Marsh is down there. It sounds hot, you know. I'm it's hot enough up here for me, and we don't even have humidity. But uh, dude, I'm just I'm pumped for football. I could not be more excited. Uh, I hear you, man. I'm I'm just ho- I'm I'm holding out hope right now. You guys, I know you guys are super excited. Obviously, Miami being in the ACC and looking like one of the only conferences is going to play. So yep. I'm sure. I, I mean, I, I'm just hoping for some semblance of football in the fall. You know, it it, do, it doesn't feel like a fall without football, to say the least. And and, and I was just talking to Jordan because you know Miami's 22 days away from the season starting, but with everything going on, it does it doesn't feel like that. It's a it's a re- it's a very weird feeling. Yeah. I, like, um, yeah, I uh, know it's it's super weird, man. Like even like, you know, you're getting some clips with like even NFL, you know, practices and stuff. I think it's just the fact of like media limitations, right? Like covering practices, doing uh-huh. some types of things. And then like like you said, like we just kind of rolled into it very abruptly here after being shut down for a while. So it's it definitely feels awkward. It feels weird. I mean, I'm, I'm just, again, holding out a little bit of hope. I saw. Notre Dame just canceled their their uh, classes the other day, yesterday or the day before, so I'm like, uh oh, is this uh, is this about to start happening now? But you know, we again, man, we need we need some football, so I'm just just being as hopeful yeah. as possible right now. Yeah, absolutely, I get you, man. absolutely. So hey. so we so the first thing we want to talk about is Gregory Rousseau. So obviously, um, a few weeks ago, he announced that he would be opting out for the 2020 season. With we all know that he is extremely talented and had a really good year last year but in your opinion with only one year of real highlight tape 
Um, and obviously we wish Greg the best because, um, you know, we're a Canes podcast. But do you think that was the best move for him and his draft uh, status? Well, I'll, I'll say this, Marsh. If if um, Greg is listening to this right now, man, I'm so upset with Greg. I, I interviewed him like four days before he declared. I'm like, dude, you couldn't have dropped it on me, you know, a little earlier to get the uh, breaking news out. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, so – I think there's a lot of layers to it. Obviously, Greg is not nearly a finished product. You know, I, I've heard that he's, in this offseason, he's up around 260, 265 pounds, somewhere in that range. So obviously playing at like 245 last year, that's a big step in the right direction because you, you look at him, you're just like, you know, the length is there. The athleticism is there. He's just a guy that is continuing to grow into that body. I, I can't blame anybody for making this type of decision, you know, going with the guys like Caleb Farley from Virginia Tech, Micah Parsons from Penn State, because with so much uncertainty, right? Like, how many games are you going to get? Is transferring yeah. the best option? If you're going to transfer, like, is that the best situation for you? Like, I just feel like there's so many things that there, there's just too many variables that are uncertain at this time. So, like, when I'm watching Greg Russo, I'm like, this dude has top 10 written all over him, you know, it, when it comes down mm -hmm. to it, because a, a because you also got to take into account, right? Like a lot of guys are also going to have one less year of film anyway, because of all the conferences shutting down. Right. So like, is he really losing that much at the end of the day, six, six, 260 pounds, probably going to blow up the combine had 15 and a half sacks in his, in his, you know, lone year of, of starting experience. I have to think that at the end of the day, NFL scouts are going to look at that and say like, Hey, right now we need to trust our coaching staff as much as possible if I have a defensive line coach that can't get the most out of that type of athletic profile, then we have some, some, um, we have some negative, negative um, aspects of our organization before we even bring a guy like Russo aboard. Yeah, yeah, I, I think the the stat is crazy, and that he has 15 and a half sacks, but only played 14 games in college, so he's averaging more than a sack a game, which is mind-boggling if you think about it. It's crazy. Yeah unheard of i mean it's yeah. it's i mean the the production he had as a redshirt freshman being a guy that played all over the place you know wide receiver in high school safety linebacker some defensive end like he didn't he wasn't able to grow into his position until his first year when he got injured a little bit there in miami so he's a guy that's still growing and like you said over a sack a game is incredible production and at the end of the day like you see the traits that back up that type of production and i think that's why he's going to end up being a top 10 pick just because you don't make guys like him too often you know i, I feel like we get guys every so often like Jadavion Clowney and uh, chase young last year but like it, it's just you don't get guys that are that athletic profile every year it, so at the end of the day yeah. people are going to look at him and say Again, we can make this guy into that double-digit sack guy every single year while continuing to work out the kinks and then, um, you know, continue to add muscle and mass to that frame. So you don't have his draft uh, stock taking a hit at all then? No, I, I don't. I, I don't think – I mean, so, yes, there's limited tape. That's going to be something that goes against him, but I just – one, for the this actual decision, I, I don't think any NFL team or any scouting department is going to knock him for making what's in his best interest in such an uncertain time. Now, the real conversation, obviously, I, I think this is what you're referring to, Jordan, mostly is like year one year of tape, right? Like that uh -huh. is a tough thing to get around. But again, when you have the, the variables that he has, the athletic profile he has, I think that you kind of overlook the fact of like, only one year of tape because it, yeah. it's a defensive end position where those traits are so important. It's not like a quarterback where the mental acumen and the mental side of the position is so paramount and the experience factor is so paramount to being successful defensive ends. Like when you look at the best defensive ends in football, those are the guys that you look at and say long athletic explosive, like those traits are so important. So when you have a guy like him with those types of traits at that point, it's, it's just all about the coaching staff getting the most out of them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Greg Rousseau, I think is one of the, the best defensive ends to come out of Miami in a very, very long time. And, and then that's saying something, but so let's move to our guy, Brevin Jordan. Now I have heard that recently you said he was your fourth tight end in the 2021 yeah. uh, draft class. Let, explain yourself. Uh, Marsh, I have him at third, okay, to start out <laughs> with. Man, don't put, don't I, put I'm pretty sure I saw you say fourth, right? That, that came from me. I'm pretty sure I saw you said 
can someone explain to me how Brevin Jordan is better than, and then you named the Penn State guy, the the guy at the Gators who no one's ever heard of it's... because no one likes the Gators. And then uh, I can't remember the third guy, but. <laughs> oh, I, 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 you guys are putting words in my mouth. I need to see this tweet before I refer to it. I, to, to answer your question, though, okay, this is my thought process with Mr. Jordan. I think Brevin Jordan is a. Uh, so I did a preliminary grade of him as a preseason. I gave him a second round grade, which is a good grade, you know, going into a additional year, right? Like he's not a finished product. He's going to be playing football this year, hopefully knock on wood. So second round preliminary grade. I'm struggling with Brevin Jordan just a little bit in comparison to Pat Fryermuth and the, the Florida tight end Kyle Pitts that we will not mention his name again after this. <laughs> I'm str- I'm struggling with Brevin just a little bit because like so it comes for for tight end evaluations for me right like there are three ways that I grade on if a guy can create separation now I know that Brevin Jordan can create as an athlete that dude is a phenomenal athlete he can run point A to point B by almost almost anybody linebackers can't cover him most safeties can't cover him I know he can get o- open in that aspect the next one is. Can he do it as a route runner? A- at times, he's not the most refined route runner. He he doesn't get out of his break consistently. Now, he flashes it, so can he eventually? Yeah, I'll, I'll put like a, a semi char- uh, check mark next to his name. Like potentially, he can be a very good route runner. The biggest aspect of his game that is absolutely missing right now, and I don't think it's going to improve because I think Brevin, I, I have the official height somewhere, but he's like 6'2 and some change. So like that, that's fine. You know, you're you're an athletic tight end. But the fact of when the ball is in the air, when the ball is placed in a bad spot, are you able to win at the catch point? I don't think he is. And then I I saw a crazy stat that was like in 15 or so opportunities at the catch point last year and contested catches. He only came down with two or three. And when you watch the film, like he doesn't win very well in the air. I don't think his ball skills are incredible. I think athletically he's he's insane. I think that somebody's going to value him in the early part of the second round, maybe at the end of the first round when all is said and done. I'm just struggling a little bit with where he's creating separation outside of being an athlete. And then as a blocker, like I think that he is technically okay. He's definitely not afraid to block. I just don't think that he has the physicality because of his lack of size to ever be a plus blocker. So struggling with him a little bit, but man, you got, this is a really nice tight end class. So being the yeah. third guy in this class is, is nothing to be ashamed of. So I like Brevin. I'm just struggling with him comparative to the other two tight ends. Yeah, I, I get that. I get that. And also um, it, it's hard because Brevin has also missed um, a good amount of time during his uh, career at Miami. Do you think that, um, it would it he should consider coming back for his senior season, or do you think it would be the best move to declare early? Uh, I I mean, so right now it looks like this tight end class might be a little stronger from t- than 2022, but obviously that is has to be played out a little bit. I'll say again, he's going to have opportunity to play. So if Brevin Jordan goes out there and he balls out, he has 800 yards, whatever it is, you know, multiple touchdowns. He has a, a phenomenal year and he cleans up some of those things as a route runner and maybe gets a little stronger, you know, um, in his lower body. I think that it makes sense for him to leave um, for argument's sake. I mean, I'm just I'm just trying to, you know, collect my thoughts on it. I, I would say, you know, if it all is very depending on this season. Would it ultimately end up draft stock, um, draft stock wise, to be a better move to come back for 2022, potentially? But I think that, hey man, at this point with all the uncertainty in the world, who knows what any football assemblance is going to look like coming forward? If you're good enough to come out, you've had you had a great season in the amount of games you had, then hey, go chase yours, go get your money. I, I definitely would not, you know, pass judgment on anybody for taking care of themselves ultimately, yeah. especially through all this tough stuff happening right now. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, uh, I think when I saw that tweet, I, I gave you a hard time and, you know, we've been giving <laughs> you a hard time on the pod now, uh, but I don't have a problem with what you're saying. I honestly don't. Um, you know, Brevin is undersized. We've actually said before, and I, I think you were on the show with us, when we discussed the possibility of Will Mallory actually being a better draft prospect when he comes out uh, because of his physical tools being, um, you know, a little better than Brevin's and that he's, he's bigger and, and uh, you know, 
could be a little faster and, and stuff like that. So uh, 